Thank you for joining the live, everyone. I'm joined here with uh, Colonel Meryl Tinsendahl, U.S. Air Force retired. She is the first U-2 fe black female pilot. Um, and I'm so glad she's joining us because we don't have a lot of time here. We have a live Q&A. Um, first, let me talk about her book. Um, it's called Shatter the Sky. And I'm going to try to turn it around here so you guys can see it. It's Shatter the Sky, What Going to the Stratosphere Taught Me About Self-Worth, Sacrifice, and Discipline. It's a good book that I recommend everyone get. Doesn't matter if you're male, female, it's for everyone. It's for, for everyone. everyone. For everyone. All right, so first, tell me a little bit about yourself for those of us who don't know, which they should, but. <laughs> That's okay. Um, a quick rundown. Um, my name is Meryl, uh, Meryl Tangestall, Colonel retired U.S. Air Force. I had 23 years of active duty service. 10 of those were in the Navy. The other 13 were in the Air Force. I've flown in both branches of service. I've flown everything from helicopters in the Navy to uh, T-34s, to be in the T-34 instructor, T-6 instructor, TH-57s, to ultimately switching over to the U-2 in 2004 to fly the T-38 and U-2. Um, I have had an interesting career. I've done leadership positions everywhere from command positions to deputy ops group commander to inspector general at the wing level, inspector general, director of inspections for the Air Force. So, um, hi there. And uh, I, after I retired, um, I didn't go the traditional route of being a commercial pilot. So I actually started becoming a personal trainer because I wanted to mentor people through fitness and seeing, making them, um, helping them be better versions of themselves. With that, uh, opened up the opportunity as I started posting on Instagram and opening up my life. Um, I got picked up for a show. You might've heard it called Tough as Nails on CBS. Yep. And the rest is uh, continual history. I came out last, last year was pretty, um, pretty exciting. The show came out, uh, mm -hmm. we, finished our adoption, and then um, I came out with the book, so. Right, and I love the book. Like I said, everyone should get it and read it. So you're a mother, author, reality star, musician, a retired colonel, pilot, personal trainer. <laughs> you're I'm a Renaissance woman. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's so amazing. Um, so what, so about your book, like I, we were discussing before, um, Oscar, when it comes to being a student pilot, we run into a lot of personalities. And tell us about some of the personalities you ran into, you know, starting off. I know with Oscar and Gramps, we talked about them. So, Let's right. See. So we'll talk. We'll talk about Oscar first. So for those who haven't read the book, mm -hmm. um, there's a, there's a story that I tell, or multiple stories that I tell in my Navy career about this. Um, thank you. Um, from Strange Mind, Dark yeah. Heart. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> there is this, there is a, a boss that I work for, an uh, officer in charge when I was uh, deploying my second deployment. We'll call him Oscar. And him and I, we didn't get along very well. And it wasn't just one-sided. There's a lot of things I did wrong as well. But later on, after we came back from deployment, he did some things politically to um, hurt my career a little bit. And, and I talk about that. But I also talk about the fact that I was in a very competitive environment. I was hungry. I was a new lieutenant. And I mean, I'm from the Bronx, so I could be a straight up savage when it comes to my words and my actions. I mean, I, this is just how it is. So, yeah. um, but it, I had a pretty big life lesson learning on how to dealing with officers who are higher rank, who are superior to you. How do you, how do you deal with that when you feel like you're in a position where they can control a lot of what happens to you. And yeah. for me, the good thing is that I had some other mentors that were outside the sphere of influence that were able to do some things outside of his control mm -hmm. and my commander's control. And I didn't, I didn't go unscathed by it. I learned from it, but I was able to progress and go fly T6s. So um, it was great to have some people in my corner that recognized my talents and my ability and understood that I was a little immature, but that's how Navy lieutenants are. And, you know, you're, you're learning how to be a leader. Yeah. And um, what it taught me is that when I was a, 
a major or, or a light colonel or colonel, you got to mentor people. You don't bury people because you don't agree with them or they're a little wild. You know, when you yeah. were that rank, you're the same way. You're out there trying to figure out who you are. You're trying to learn an aircraft. You're being competitive. You want what you want. So, so mentorship so that was, was really important to you. Yeah. Ment mentorship is huge because I had got, I had gotten mentorship at such an early age from, um, you know, Miss Harriet, who was an educator who gave me Star Trek books to feed into my odd obsession with Star Trek to mm -hmm. Gramps, who's in the book that was my first flight instructor, who's incredibly, incredibly hard on me. I mean, mm -hmm. this man cursed me out in the aircraft um, on a daily basis. I mean, I was having nightmares, but yeah, and you could have, that could have went the other way. You could have cussed him out back and then what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's unwise in any flight mm -hmm. school situation, whether it's <laughs> whether it's whether it's commercial or not. Um, that yeah. like, yeah, I I may be crazy, but I'm not dumb. So, <laughs> this, um, <laughs> but I knew Gramps was doing it to get the best out of me, and mm -hmm. when I needed him at a time where I felt insecure about who I was, he was there to uh, he was there to, you know, pick me up, motivate me and really bring things in perspective of me about the person I am, the skill set that I have. So um, mm -hmm. I really appreciated that for him. I mean, we still, you know, he was at my retirement ceremony. We still laugh about it. Um, yeah. about how he, was. he was like, I wasn't that bad. And I said to him, the hell you were, you were, you were wild. <laughs> yeah. So Oscar, <laughs> is he still alive or have you seen him again or? Oh, Oscar's, Oscar's alive. Um, <laughs> That's why you got You know, it's funny. You know what's funny? Uh, a couple of years ago, I, I think a couple of years ago, Oscar started following me on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually I, what I, happens. I, I checked. I checked to see if he still follows me. He does, or maybe he doesn't. I don't know. Um, I did. I He's did have a one star. Right now. <laughs> he might be. I did get a one star in the book, so I figured it was him. <laughs> Because yeah. there was no explanation. It was just one star. I was like, come on, man. Say say you hated it for a reason. Right, right, right. Um, so she's talking about her book. I'm going to promote your book again. It's um, it's called Shatter the Sky. And it's what going to the stratosphere taught me about self-worth, sacrifice, and discipline. And like I said, it's for everyone. It's not just for an aspiring female pilot. It's for anyone who wants to get into aviation. It's a really good book. So, thank you. We have a lot of questions here. Um, we're gonna start off with um, the U two plane. not it okay well let's get to it what was the selection process for you to get assigned to the u2 that's the first question so for all those who are who are pilots out there and are interested in the u2 there is a selection process there's an application that you fill out you could go to i think the bl air force base website they still have it for u2 application so that's what i did um i filled that out submitted that you have to get a whole bunch of paperwork. There's some criteria. You have to have X amount of instructor hours, X amount of flight hours. And then once you do that, they look at your record, they look at your whole package, and then they either invite you out for an interview, which is a, about two weeks, or they don't. So I don't know what the numbers are, but at that time, about 50% of the people who applied for the interview got accepted. And of those people who did the full interview, about 50% get selected to fly the U2. Um, I know right now they have started to take one student a year right out of pilot training into the U2. They still have to oh, interview wow. for that. So they just started, it's a pot, no pun intended, it's a pilot program. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I went out there, the interesting thing for me is that I was in the Navy and I actually had to do an inter-service transfer request in conjunction with the interview request. So um, when I got picked up for an interview, I went out the first week, you just, interview with the commanders of both the 99th RS, which is deployable squadron and the one RS, which is the training squadron. And at that point, after the first week, they ask, they say, Hey, we want to continue on and give you three flights in the aircraft. And in those three flights, they, they see how teachable you are. 
And at the end, they say, hey, we'd like to hire you or thanks, but no thanks. Um, mm -hmm. During that time, they, during the interview, they do claustrophobia checks. They do uh, medical checks. They do all these mm -hmm. things to start setting everything in place if you get accepted. So uh, okay. that's how it went. So my interviews, I talk about it in the book a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of my interviews were pretty interesting. I had one with uh, one of the DOs. We still laugh about it to this day. Uh, my flights were okay. Um, it really clicked to me on the last flight because I thought I was progressing okay. But the last flight, when mm -hmm. uh, my instructor Muff said this one thing to me, he's like, "You, how's this airspeed look? How's this, how's this oh, all look? I'm like, I'm off. And he's like, well, fix it. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, sometimes it requires, well, fix it. You gotta yeah. fix it. Why are you not fixing it? I'm like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what was the most challenging part about flying the YouTube? Yeah. So what was the most challenging part? I know it has a bicycle gear and then you have to stall two feet above the, is it two feet above the runway in order to land yes. it or, and then you can't be plus or minus. You got to be on the numbers with it. So, right, how, so did you, how did you? Yes. So the U2, I mean, the U2 is very finicky in that way. So for those who don't know, I mean, if I describe it, it's basically a glider with a huge jet, one jet engine on the back. Mm -hmm. And the aircraft loves to fly because it has a large wingspan. So the landings are very critical, especially if you're doing, you know, we're doing eight plus hour missions. So you're flying your mission, you come back. Mm -hmm. The last thing you're doing is the landing. After sitting in the same area for all these hours, you're tired, hungry, all, all these other things. So you have to pay attention. You're correct. There is a bicycle landing gear con um, configuration. So you have a big main gear in the front, a small tail wheel on the back, which is basically like a skateboard. Yeah. It does not land like a traditional aircraft. You actually have a mobile, which is another pilot in the car behind you following, giving you calls to make sure you keep the uh, the main wheel at two feet. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you are too high and you stall the aircraft at four or five feet, you are going to break the aircraft. We've had it happen before where mm -hmm. people have actually broken the the spine and the spar in the aircraft and mm -hmm. we're not flying anymore. So yeah. uh, for that purpose, you just have to be on point. It's not, hey, I could be five knots fast and it's okay. It's not okay in the U2. If you do a no flap landing in the U2, for every knot you're fast is another potential thousand feet down the runway. If you have wow. 12,000 feet down the runway and you're landing in the first 1,500 feet, but you're five knots fast, you're landing past midfield on the 12,000 mm -hmm. foot runway. For all you pilots out there, you know that might be a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. So, um, your landings have to be on point. You can't have a bad day in that aircraft. Yeah. And I've seen, you know, and I've seen the aircraft and you can't be <laughs> some pilot girl was like, oh my God. <laughs> um, the other thing is this aircraft will humble you in a heartbeat. I mean, I've seen people with 2000 hours make a mistake like it's their first day and get themselves in trouble. So you can't, some aircraft, but you like, oh, I can fly this in my my sleep or do whatever. The U two, no, nah, she'll kill you. She's the slowest aircraft that'll kill you the quickest if you disrespect her. So that's yeah. why she's the dragon lady. <laughs> you don't mess with her. Yeah. So does it go above seventy thousand feet, or can you say you probably can't? I could tell you it goes above seventy thousand feet. <laughs> Have you been? I I've been above <laughs> seventy thousand feet. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, how far from your base can you fly the U-2 on a single mission? So I'm not going to get into how far you can fly because, you know, people can reverse engineer that and say, oh. Well. So yeah. um, I will tell you we've flown. I mean, I've there are times I've flown to get in theater over two hours mm -hmm. and wow. still did a full mission and have come back. So the U-2, it doesn't have any refueling capability, but the fuel burn is very efficient up at altitude. So mm -hmm. um, we're not burning a lot of gas. So our loiter time is incredibly long. Wow. And that's, and that's why, you know, I joke about it with people, but for a pilot to sit in that aircraft for that long in that confined of a space, 
you got to be a little not quite right to do that, right? <laughs> so um, yeah. it's and I and I love it because you have to be of a special mindset and have you know this mental fortitude that maybe some people don't have. So um, mm-hmm. I, you know, I I, I like it. I, I don't mind it. It's very relaxing and peaceful for me. And then I know that what I'm doing is helping the ground troops on the ground or helping move the mission further or getting that, you know, having people have that battle space awareness. I, I love doing that. I love being yeah. able to send products to the end user and having the, the DGS or ground station. Somebody said, <laughs> it is somebody bad. said it is it bad. bad on bathroom breaks. <laughs> it is bad for bathroom breaks. Um, it, it <laughs> Yeah. Um, if some people don't know, they could see one of my, uh, um, interviews that I did at Physiological Support Squad and when I talk about um, going to the bathroom in the U2 and how intricate it is. Yeah. I saw where you, in your book where you talked about like you read some stuff to be, and then that's what got you into personal training, like aspiring to be a personal trainer. So what else did you do in there? So I'm just trying to... <laughs> yeah, so I, I did, I mean, there are times when you're traveling in theater and once you do all your checklists and you check in and everything and you have some time, you know, you bring reading material. I mean, it, it is not uncommon for people who are doing air command and staff college or air war college to take up a book with them to read on the way mm-hmm. to in theater. For me, um, I started, I mean, I've always been into physical training and, um, my mom, there's there's a joke between me and my mom when uh, when she was alive that as a woman, when you're working in a very male dominated field, especially when you're deployed, there's a lot of, not a lot, but there's, there's I mean, guys are guys, there's pornography and stuff. <laughs> and to combat that, my mom used to send me a Playgirl magazine every so often. Yeah. <laughs> so in this one particular flight, I took that up to read and the article was on Jack LaLanne. And for those who work in the fitness industry, I mean, he revolutionized a lot of things especially you know part inventing the smith machine so it talked all about his his the way he (laughs) he he talked very much about fitness and what it meant to him and what he did and his wife and how they were into it and i loved reading the article and no there were no pictures of him (laughs) at that time he was like 94 we don't need to see that yeah as much as i love him no (laughs) <laughs> That's a hard pass. So it, it's basically um, you took pictures too, also up there, right? Like what else? Like what were their missions for? So the YouTube's mission, <clears throat> yeah. The, so the YouTube's mission, <laughs> <laughs> the YouTube's <laughs> mission is intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. So it's an ISR platform. Mm-hmm. So the YouTube takes imagery in the form of pictures, like you would take with a Polaroid camera. Um, it could take electrical, uh, electrical optical. It can also take Doppler. Mm. And um, it also has sensors to listen. And when I mean listen, it listens to everything. Wow. And we'll just keep it there. That's, a, that's amazing. <laughs> okay, so, so somebody asked, how did you keep yourself mentally and physically fit to withstand the long flight? So for me, I mean, it's working out every day. Um, one of the things that YouTube pilots are susceptible to is the same as divers is uh, decompression sickness. And that's, that, was, that happened a lot. And one of the things that helps combat that is your physical fitness. Um, you know, there's a lot of factors into whether you're going to get DCS that day, uh, decompression sickness. You know, did you... Did you pre-breathe for a long enough time? You know, um, how hydrated are you? What's your age? How fit are you to withstand those long hours? So it behooves all the YouTube pilots to have some type of physical conditioning. Um, Even pilots in general, especially if you're flying planes that are high G, um, also high altitude, you wanna be in in great shape. Um, that just helps you withstand some of the physiological effects. It's not going to make you impenetrable to it, but it helps relieve those right. things. So, and in, in the U2, <laughs> we typically will fly a mission, anything over two and a half hours. The next day is a day off period because you're, when I was flying the aircraft, the cabin mm-hmm. altitude was about 29,000 feet. So you had to take the next day off. The following day was ground duties only. 
and then you were you were eligible for a flight the next time. So um, I just kept in shape because that's what I like to do. When I deployed, after I uh, came back from a flight the next day, I'm in the gym. I'm hitting a I'm hitting a punching bag. I'm doing some martial arts. I'm lifting weights. I'm I'm doing all those things. So for me, physical fitness has been important in my life. I did sports and music in my life, and that's a great outlet for keeping your mental focus, um, keeping yourself in shape, and just yeah. getting things out. Yeah. So right. Why yes. not? Mm-hmm. Um, so back to the YouTube, can you talk about what makes it invisible to radar? So, I mean, the U2 was designed back in 1955. For those who saw me on Tough as Nails, I had a shirt that said Dragon Lady 1955. That is the year that the U2 came out under the CIA program. It was a black program. And um, they had it because it was high altitude. It was supposed to be out of the weapons range of the SA. Um, I believe the SA-2s at the time. So it does have black paint. Um, I'm sure that may help a little bit. It does, you know, you could see it, mm -hmm. but, you know, the, the whole thing about it is that it flies high enough that no one's touching you. We don't have weapons on our aircraft, so mm -hmm. we're not a threat. We just hang out and we just, we're, we're kind of like my, we're kind of like my daughter in everyone else's business. That's what we do. <laughs> We're in your business. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I have some student pilot questions for you. Um, and some of them you already answered, and a lot of this is in your book, too. They go out and get your book. Um, do you feel that it's harder for women to become pilots? And I already know the answer to this one. <laughs> is it harder for women to become pilots? So I'll, I'll put it to you this way. In the 1990s, when I was looking to join the military for flight training, I remember talking to the Marine Corps, and they said women could not be combat pilots at the time in the Marine Corps. And the Navy and the Air Force were switching over, right? So, you know, women were not in the field as much. When I went to flight school, they had a, a huge influx of minorities come in because they were recruiting because they wanted diversity, diversity and inclusion. And a lot of people didn't make it. There were five women, five women of color, including myself, that went through flight school in Corpus Christi at the time. I was the only one to finish. Mm. Two of them didn't make it because of medical reasons. They blew their eardrums out. The other two didn't make it because of just um, capability. They just weren't trainable. So there are people who are interested. Now, whether they make it all the way, it, it just, it may or may not happen. I think it's getting a little bit better, but I wish I could pull up. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to mess this up. But someone mm -hmm. sent me a text message as to the statistics of how many women, women of color, mm -hmm. are in the military flying in aviation. And I think the final in all branches of service. And I could send that to you. Mm -hmm. And um, the yeah, final total is that they make up about um, less than one percent of all the pilots in the military. Um, I think the Coast Guard and the Air Force had the highest rate or mm -hmm. highest amount. And then, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll probably do a post on it one day yeah, about that. Interesting. Because it, yeah. was, it was a very interesting chart. Um, last week I was in Colorado Springs at the Air Force Academy. And I met one of my students from 19 years ago. She's now a Lieutenant Colonel. And wow. she showed me the chart and I said, hey, send it to me. So it's on my, it's on my text message. But okay. we're getting better, but it's just slow and steady. And mm -hmm. and just because, you know, as a woman of color, you enter the military doesn't mean you stay. I mean, the airlines are hiring, things are happening. Yeah. So um, it's getting better, but it's slow. But we just have to be persistent. And then yeah. one day those numbers will be up. So that's, I, I truly believe that. It just right. takes a long time. And I and I explained that in the book a little bit. When I, mm -hmm. when I became, a, when I, when I got selected for Colonel, I was one of two black women. I was one of two black women in the Air Force who were a rated pilot above 06 active duty. Mm. There were two of us, me yeah. and General Harris. She was a yeah. two star at the time. So, wow. you know, to groom someone or to get someone to that point is hard enough. So, right. if there's not, if there's a small pool of us, I mean, that pool is even smaller. So, but we're just going to, we're going to keep being persistent. Sorry, mm -hmm. my cat wants to get up here. 
It's okay. Um, yeah, keep being persistent. That so so why did you not want to go into the airlines and take like um a United or something like that? So this is um I had no interest in transporting people when I wanted to fly or okay. cargo. I mean yeah. the aircraft that I flew, I flew helicopters, I flew U two, single seat high altitude. I wanted weapons on an aircraft. Yeah. Um, the H-60 had, at that time when I was in there, we had Penguin missile, Hellfire missile, Flare. We used MVG. We we were a plug and play system. And since I didn't get jets, I I wanted, yeah, you know, I wanted to be tactical. I yeah. love the tactical aspect. I love the maintenance aspect. So, um, transporting people, which I think is great because the per diem is awesome. You get. You get to go to a lot of cool places. I just didn't want that. I wanted to be grimy and gritty. Like I was just like, yeah, that's the, that resonated with me the most. So yeah, um, yeah. So that's that's why the airlines was not my first choice getting out. Um, I knew once I made colonel, lieutenant colonel, that I wanted to um, motivate people. I liked, you know, I wanted to motivate people to be a better versions of themselves. I saw what I can do when I was a director of operations in the physiological support squad. And I saw the impact that I had as a mm -hmm. woman. Um, and I, I enjoyed that. And I, I just said, look, I just want to help people. I want to mentor people like I was mentored. So yeah, I it's thought, about representation. Yep. So someone asked, yeah. when did you find your most important mentor? And I think you had a lot of them that helped you along the way. And one of them was uh, that time when you were on the deck and you were I don't want to give it too much away, but you were kind of crying and you told him and he, he was like, okay, got it. He yeah. Like, so, okay. So those people are so important in people's lives that they just don't realize, like they can keep your career going. Right. So, you know, that was my first deployment and in the first deployment, again, this was um, in the nineties. So they were just starting to female modify ships permanently. Um, so we were on the CG-60, the McInerney, mm -hmm. and I was with the GW Battle Group. And my OIC, uh, the late um, Commander Blaisdell, Lieutenant Commander Blaisdell, may he rest in peace, great man. Um, he was my OIC, and he was, he was outstanding. And this was my first deployment as a, as a helicopter second pilot, and I had a befriended a, a guy on the ship who was another uh, lieutenant and I was a lieutenant junior grade. And we became good friends. But the one thing about ships is when, as a female, you're friends with a man, dude, you are sleeping with them. It's, it's, like, it's like, oh, something's going on. It's like college. Yeah, it's like college. Oh, you're friends? You guys are sleeping together. And what people didn't know is that he was going through a divorce. He was, he was a hot mess. And, you know, we, we just chilled and and he would talk and we would talk, you know, no one, I remember one time he was bummed. He's like, my wife, my ex, soon to be ex-wife's not sending me any gifts, you know, while we're deployed. I call my mom and my mom and her friends at work are sending him care packages and devil dogs and all this stuff. Like we were good friends, but mm -hmm. it, the rumors got to be so bad, so bad that they were like, hey, when you're in the room with him, they started making procedure. Like you have to keep the door open. Mm -hmm. You can't be with him in this time. And that started to wear on me because, you know, here I was being a good shipmate, a good friend, and, you know, all these people are talking too much and not minding their business. And, you know, it just, by month four on a ship, you know, you yeah. just start to break. You know, you're under pressure, you're flying, you're not seeing your family, I'm, I'm not with my boyfriend, and I got to hear this crap. <laughs> so, um, my OIC came up at a time where I was just letting it out. And there are just times in life when you're working and you're so frustrated and there's no way, no amount of work out in the world could get it out. And you just gotta, it comes out how it comes out and there's nothing wrong right. with that. But he caught me right. and he was like, what? Cause he is like, he's like, what the hell is going on? And I told him, <laughs> he goes, and he's basically like, okay, I got this. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, no one says a word. Like it's, yeah, the rumor stopped the innuendo stopped, the little, mm -hmm. the little needling stopped. And it was just like, man, I could take a lot, but sometimes it was just enough's enough. So it's important. It's important to have good mentors like that. Yeah. People who have your back and are like, 
oh, I'll take care of it. So, yeah. you know, it was those little touch points in my life that made me say, okay, I'm going to do the same for people when I see them down and I'm going to make the effort. And right. if I have to break, a, if I have to break a little bit of glass, oh, well, exactly. you go so clean we, it up. We have so a YouTube, way. so we're almost out of time, but we have a YouTube question again. It says, how much head movement in the helmet do you have that you need a landing vehicle in the YouTube? How much head movement do you have? How much do you have that you need a landing vehicle in the YouTube? So I, I, it's okay, so head it's a, movement, right? So it's about um, the visibility outside, like mm -hmm. outside the front. So yeah. the helmet, you can move like this. Okay. Like in order to turn your whole body while you're in the suit, uh, mm -hmm. it's a giant effort. Like if yeah. you start moving around in the suit in 30 seconds, you start to break a sweat. That's how that's how much effort it takes. Wow. Um, if the suit is inflated, and it inflates for some reason, and it's stuck inflating, you can't get it down. Your body is stuck like this. This is why we have a yoke in the cockpit, oh. because you can't grab a stick. So we have a yoke because your mm -hmm. hands are in this frozen position. It requires a lot of effort. So um, looking out and moving your head back and forth, it just takes a lot of effort. So why not have someone in the back giving you those calls to pick up a lot of the visual cues to land in no drift, no crab on center line? It could be an effort. I mean, we learn over time to land well. So the mobile in the back is just our wingman on the ground. Yeah. Um, we do, we do, most people don't know this, but we do no voices. We land without someone giving us calls. Wow. We we practice that because if you have a engine failure and you go to another field where there's no help, you have to be able to land the aircraft. So mm -hmm. we have that sight of two feet and where we need to be. Um, but just for safety purposes, we don't have a lot of aircraft that we need to break. So have a mobile. Yeah. Just, it makes sense. Nice. Okay, so we're we're about running out of time here, but um, I, so this is another question. I also like in your book that um, you were really focused on yourself. Like it wasn't a selfish focus, but it was more like um, I'm going to do what I want to do and I'm going to get it done. And so then yes. you decided eventually to have a family. What do you say to women who feel like they got to choose? Like either I'm going to have a family or I'm going to be a pilot. Or what do you say to those women? So what I say is timing is everything and you got to take it. You got to look at your life and where, where do you want to be? How do you put yourself to where you want to be in the future? For me, you know, my husband wanted, wanted children and, and I had to wrap my mind around that because yes, I'm an only child and I had really, I had some specific goals that I wanted to get. But I started to think, like, how can we make this work? And the thing is, on my staff tour. So when am I going to have a staff tour? Okay. Yeah. I'm 41. Ooh, this is going to be difficult. But I'm in good shape. All right. Well, let's, let's go do that. So it's, it's about timing. It's about where you want to put yourself. And sometimes it's about sacrifice. It's about saying, okay, if I have this kid, I may not get as high as I want to be. Maybe I won't be an astronaut. You got to be okay with that. You, you can't be bitter about it. You have to think about it and make those decisions and those decisions I make. And I haven't regretted it. There's mm -hmm. some people who have kids really early. And I tell you what, right now, since I have a nine to seven year old, good for them because I'm tired every day. <laughs> but there are some people who have them later in life. And I'm like, oh, I have maybe a little bit more financially stable. I could give them what they want so they could be ungrateful little urchins, but they, yeah. they have the whole world in front of them, right? So <laughs> yeah. um, it's about making those choices and being okay with those choices. Right. Um, and you still yeah, take so time for yourself. Like you still kind of like, I'm going to do me. I'm going to take some time in Vegas, do me, and then come I back to the... <laughs> How important is that? <laughs> um, it is a thousand percent important that you have to set time for yourself. Mm -hmm. That you have to do the things that bring you joy other than your kids who bring you joy, sorrow, and anger. Like, so you have to do those things that you could say is mine and mine alone and I could do. It. That's really important to me. And it could be because I was an only child and because I like my alone time. I like to just sit in a room quiet. It's, it's mm -hmm. beautiful. That's why I like the U2. 
Um, but I need to take, and my husband knows that's very important to me. And yeah. if I don't get that time, I get, I get to be a little grumpasaurus. So, but you have to make that time for you because if you allow people to take up all your time, they will, and they will, <laughs> they will suck the life force out of you. And then you're just not good for anyone. So, um, that's, yeah. uh, that's why I've, oh, my man Fletcho. So I'm looking at this last one. What advice would I say to the next generation of female pilots? Mm -hmm. That might like, be their question. Yeah, so for the next generation, those women out there who are thinking about flying commercially, joining the military um, in any capacity, go out and get that. There are so many avenues to do it. There are so many organizations right now, like Legacy Flight Academy, if you're a young kid that is interested. They have these scholarships out there that help you with your private pilot's license. Those that are getting out of the military that might be interested, use your GI Bill to get your ratings. Um, it is it is so wide open, and they need pilots very badly right now, and it's a great field to go into. It's a great skill set to have. So those female pilots that are out there, all us old, older, um, older wise women out there that have paved the way for you, Get out there and kill it and get after it. Seriously, yeah. it like we. I remember when uh, Fly for the Culture posted. They gave me a Discovery flight and they posted. Shout out to them, Fly for the Culture, because they're a good organization, also. Oh yeah, they're great. And, and they posted, and I said I was about to give up, but then you're like, "Don't you dare give up! Don't you dare. don't!" And I'm not gonna give up. <laughs> I, I don't give up. You have an instructor. If you're in the civilian world and you have an instructor that you are unhappy with. You vote with your feet and your money and you go to someone else who will take yeah. care of you or someone else that you click with. Don't let someone else take you out of your game. If you were playing a game of basketball and someone's trash talking to you, you still got to shoot that layup. Yeah. And when that game is over, walk away, go play another game. But don't mm -hmm. quit about, don't quit because someone, you know, is yelling at you because they had a bad day. Don't let that, don't let their bad day be your bad day. Right. And then right. you have a candid conversation with them. Um, in the military, if you have an instructor that is incredibly difficult like I did, I hate to say it, you got to suck it up. And then you have to have that heart-to-heart -heart talk with them and say, sir, look, uh, with all, I don't say with all due respect because you're about to say something disrespectful, but like, <laughs> sir, is there another way we could come about this? And maybe they're receptive, but if they're a Marine Corps instructor like some I met, they won't be. So. Um, you're just going to have to grit it and say, wow, I'm going to write this in my journal because this might be my next book chapter. Right. <laughs> dealing, dealing with my personal gramps. <laughs> exactly. But, but I will yeah. tell you what, at the end of the day, all military people typically that are in that flight program who are instructors love what they do and they want to see the best out of you. Mm -hmm. So just exactly. keep that in mind and you give it all you got. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you for your time. I know you're busy. Um, oh, thank so I you really for having appreciate me. It. I did want to say if you're a female pilot and you're interested in joining the 99s, go to the website and click on join. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. And please uh, go get our book. Let me let me promote this book one more time. Hold on. <laughs> it's called Shatter the Sky. What going to the stratosphere taught me about self worth, sacrifice, and discipline. All the questions you have are in this book. I promise you. And it helps. And it's just not for female pilots. It's for everyone. So go out and get the book. Absolutely, I, everyone. And one thing I want to say about the book for those who feel like man, I'm in this situation that's bad and stuff. If you have that attitude that you will do whatever it takes to get there, yep. not breaking the rules, then hopefully my stories in there will help you remember what's most important for you and to keep that focus and to find those people. Because if you keep moving along the way, you're going to find those mentors. You're going to find those mm -hmm. advocates for you. You're going to find those allies right. through all the adversity and challenges that will help you get to where your next level. And if you can't, then you DM me. You know, yeah. you know I answer DMs. Yeah, yeah, you do. Like, people get shocked. They're like, you're talking to me. Sometimes I'll just video chat and I'll be like, yeah, what do you want? What, what's your question? I don't understand. They're right. like, because I saw you like, post your book on your Instagram and I'm like, oh, I'm going to get it. And then I read it and then I DM'd you. And then I'm like, oh, she answered. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I, if, I, if I have time and I'm not somewhere else and I am have a moment and someone DMs me, 
I may not get back to you quickly, but I, I will. Right. Or go check out my website, mt at merrilltengestall.com, and just send me an email. I, I want right. to, I'll mentor people. I'll try to give you some advice. Right. Let's go. That's what yep. my shirt says. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go, people. Right. Thank you so much, Mary. I really appreciate you, honestly. You've been inspiring. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you.